1138 this morning, it now appears that there are no survivors from Space Shuttle Challenger, the 25th mission, and the only fatality since 1967 when three astronauts were killed in a fire at the Kennedy Space Center. Marianne? First, as you said, Tom, the first in-air disaster in the uh, Man in Space program of the United States. Let's go back to Washington now and read Collins. Well, as we know, the president has been informed. He is saddened. He is anxious, according to Larry Speaks. We'll hear more about that. The House of Representatives has adjourned after its chaplain said a prayer for those seven, their families, and, of course, for the nation. The House of Representatives has trooped quietly out of the Capitol Hill. In front of a chilled White House, chilled the more so because of the events of this past hour, my colleague Charles Bierbauer. Charles? Reed, we know that the president was in the Oval Office at the time of the explosion, actually preparing for a briefing with some reporters on his State of the Union address tonight. Word was brought to him by National Security Advisor Admiral John Poindexter and the Vice President. He went immediately to his study, watched a rerun of the explosion on television there, and White House spokesman Larry Speaks conveyed to us just a few moments ago the President's reaction. The, Union. the Vice President and the Foreign Policy Advisor John Poindexter uh, came in with others and informed the President that the news had just broken. Uh, we immediately adjourned our Oval Office meeting and went into an adjoining uh, room, the President's study, where there's a television, and the President then began to review television reports of the uh, explosion there shortly after the launch. So once again, the President is, is concerned, he is, uh, is, is saddened, he is uh, very uh, anxious to have more information on it at the moment, as I say, we're learning most of our information from what the public is getting. What is yes, the best sir. information? Spokesman Speaks said that the president watched the explosion, the tape replay, in stunned silence, that he really did not say much, but that the tragic emotion was on his face and very evident. Uh, Speaks said that, of course, the White House is trying to get further information, that that was their uh, top priority to find out just what had happened, particularly the concern for the crew. It was, of course, President Reagan who came up with the program for sending a teacher in space, the first civilian to make that trip, and there is that a uh, distinct link between the president and the space program. In response to most questions, uh, the White House spokesman really could not make any definitive answer at this point, too much unknown. As far as the space program itself goes, uh, spokesman Larry Speaks said, despite the tragedy, that should not deter the U.S. space program, which has been one of this nation's great successes. Reed? Charles, of course, the president has a public duty to perform tonight his State of the Union address at 9 Eastern time. It seems, does it not, almost inevitable that uh, this is going to cast a long and mournful shadow over even that? Well, the president had hoped to make the kind of speech that was being described here as visionary, laying out uh, uh, his hopes for this country through the, into the next century. Uh, I, I think it is uh, fair to guess, uh, in fact, Mr. Speaks sort of indicated that the president would be compelled to have something to say uh, about this tragedy, and I think we will hear that tonight. Yes, it does indeed cast a pall on this event. But that is the latest live from the White House, where, as Charles says, the president has been informed. And now let's go back to the scene in NASA Live. Launch approximately a minute or so after uh, tower clear. There was an apparent explosion of uh, the orbiter. At the time, uh, uh, data was lost approximately a minute into the flight. Uh, that was uh, shortly after a throttle up 204% of the three main engines. The flight director pulled uh, positions, flight controller positions in the room uh, later on and this morning and uh, was informed that there were no anomalous indications uh, at the time. Uh, tracking reported uh, impact of the vehicle uh, with the water. According to data, that was approximately 18 miles downrange at the time uh, data stopped. Recovery forces being deployed to the field, being uh, they're unable, were unable uh, shortly to uh, to enter the specific area because of a continuing falling debris, and at about this time, are being admitted to, to the impact area. Contingency procedures are in effect, and following those procedures, all of the data 
uh, available in, in mission control uh, from the flight at the point uh, or up to the point of the incident. Uh, data is being secured and will be carefully evaluated. We have no additional information at this time and we'll keep you advised as other details become available. This is Mission Control, Houston. Among the Americans who saw the devastation that struck America's space program and seven people aboard the space shuttle were the husband of 37-year-old New Hampshire school teacher Krista McAuliffe and her nine-year-old daughter. It was last July 19th that CNN correspondent Tony Clark talked with Krista McAuliffe as she prepared for her role aboard the shuttle. Um, the training will start um, in September. Did you think that you were ever going to fail in any part of the testing? Um, no, that wasn't really part of the evaluation process. So even if I had gotten sick on it, I would, I'd still be all right. Were you surprised by any of the testing or anything? Did you think it was harder than The intensity of it. Just lots and lots of things crammed into a week. I mean, we were just running from early in the morning to late at night. Do you think that was part of the training or the testing? Well, maybe, but I think there were also, they knew that we only had the, us for a short period of time. They were just trying to cram it as much as possible so that we could really experience everything that we could in that, that short period of time. Scott said today you were going to take one of his pet frogs along on the flight. Is that going to be right. one? Right. Yes, we're going to put that frog right on the shuttle. This is Scott. This is Scott. Okay. Scott does, the frog, does the frog have a name? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Legal. Legal. <laughs> Legal, the frog is going to go into space? Yeah. That's part of the deal. Does NASA know about this? I, have, I do have a personal compartment on board the shuttle. I can't take some things along with me. I'm not big enough for any of you. But <laughs> actually, have you seen the inside? You must have yeah. seen the inside yeah. of one of these things. Yeah. It's a personal compartment. How yeah. comfortable it's, is it's it? It's probably about this big and about that. So that you can bring some of the, some things that you you know you'd like Personal to wear. Yeah, <laughs> t-shirts that you're going to wear. And things for your family. What kind of t-shirts you're going to wear? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to I'll have to get a good New Hampshire one. <laughs> can you tell us about the camaraderie between you and the other nine finalists? Oh, it's just wonderful. It really is. I mean, we went through so much. And all I can liken it to is um, having a, a small bunch of people go so many kisses. <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, finally, what's it like? <laughs> We're sitting up. Oh, oh she's resting? Oh, who's with her? Oh. <laughs> now it's 20 seconds. A long 20 seconds. Is this like a countdown? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Dion, Krista is here with me now. She just got off the plane a while ago, and I know that you were chosen for this mission partly because of your disposition. You've been giggling since you got here. Tell me. Why, again, you've said it so many times, why is this so important to you, making this trip on the show? Well, it's important for a lot of reasons, but I think the most important thing is to humanize the space age to a point where everybody feels a part of it, and the students really connect with that. They're the wave of the future. They're the ones who are going to have to deal with the space stations and beyond, and I really hope and feel that it's part of the teaching profession to bring those new career opportunities. I know, it's wonderful. Boy. Okay, all right, so how does it feel to be back in New Hampshire? It feels great to be home. I am really delighted because I kept hearing about all of these wonderful things that people were doing while I was down in Washington, while I was down in Houston, and I couldn't share with that. Yeah. You know, and Steve would tell me on the phone, and he'd say, you know, you got some letters, or, you know, people called, and, and I couldn't share with that, so I'm really glad I'm home. How long are you going to be home for? Well, hopefully I'll be home on and off for about a month, so I'll, I'll be able to spend some time in New Hampshire. <laughs> yeah. I've got to ask you, when did you find out? Did you find out just before the announcement or... Yeah, we did. We asked as a group, um, we requested that we find out prior to going into the room. It was a small room. There were a lot of press there. We've invested an awful lot of emotion in these last two weeks, and we really felt that we needed to find out and compose ourselves before walking into the room. So we did, we did know when, before we walked in. What were your feelings when you found out? <laughs> well, 
it was it was rather funny when when we were talking about um, uh, what was happening at home, and, and I was saying something to the effect that, you know, well, you know, when I'm not home, and, and I said my husband really relies on cornflakes and milk because that's kind of his staple. <laughs> and the end, Bradley turned around and kind of not, without missing a beat, she turned around and she said to me while the whole group was together, she said, I "Think you better buy some more cornflakes and milk." <laughs> The students at Krista McAuliffe's Concord High School in New Hampshire were among those watching the launch, the liftoff on television. They cheered, and they continued to cheer, not realizing something had gone wrong, until a teacher hushed them, told them to be quiet because she knew something had gone wrong. At that point, students were overheard saying, this can't be real, we can't be watching this. The school principal then asked all reporters and photographers to leave the school. Read. Bob, as we've heard, the president was in the White House. He quickly was summoned and watched some of the terrifying replays of the disaster that overtook Challenger. Across the Potomac, the Secretary of Defense, Casper Weinberger, was in his office complex as well. He was conferring with other people about the business of defense. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Crow, was with him, we understand. The secretary was advised of what had befallen the Challenger, and he quickly adjourned his meeting, went to a an adjoining television room to watch. Casper Weinberger watched, as you have also, and his comment was, oh, no. Then his concern was uh, apparent from that comment only, shocked and disappointed. But the quote from the Secretary of Defense, probably that of all of America, Bob, oh, no. Mary Ann. Also um, at the Cape, or just actually three and a half miles from the Cape, watching as it happened this morning where uh Krista McAuliffe's two parents Edward and Grace Corrigan were watching from a VIP area some three and a half miles away the uh, wire services are reported uh, serving the two of them hugging and sobbing as they saw the explosion aboard the shuttle NASA immediately after the explosion on the shuttle was silent for quite some time made uh, hardly any reference rather than acknowledging that there had been an explosion and there were recovery efforts underway um, we did have one official statement from NASA, and we'll play that back for you now. We had an apparently uh, nominal liftoff uh, this morning at 11.38 Eastern Time. Uh, the ascent phase appeared normal through approximately the uh, uh, completion of the roll program and uh, throttle down and uh, engine throttle back to 104%. Uh, at that point, we had an apparent uh, explosion. Subsequent to that, uh, the tracking uh, crews reported to the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle uh, appeared to have exploded and that uh, we had an impact uh, in the water downrange at a location approximately 28.64 degrees north, 80.28 degrees west. At the time, the data was lost uh, with the vehicle. Um, According to uh, a poll by the flight, uh, flight director, Jay Green, of the positions here in Mission Control, there were no anomalous indications, uh, no indications uh, of problems with the uh, uh, engines or with the SRBs uh, or with any of the other systems at that, uh, at that moment uh, through the point at which we lost data. Again, this is preliminary information. Uh, it's all that we have at the moment. Well, I... It was about one minute into flight when the explosion took place, but for 55 minutes downrange, about nine miles from the Kennedy Space Center, the debris continued to fall. That prevented, according to NASA, some of the emergency operations from moving into the area for that amount of time. But most of the pieces that we could at least see through our picture falling through after the explosion, here's a replay in slow motion. You can see the fire develop on both sides of the external tank, and in about a half a second, you'll see it break apart right there. And it turns into a fireball. Then one of the solid rocket boosters, can't tell whether it's the right one or the left one, careens off to the right-hand side. Still intact. The solid rocket booster was intact. Huge fireball where the shuttle sits next to the external tank. There's the solid rocket that going off to the right. 
And in just a second, you'll see the other solid rocket also still intact, going to the left. The silence, the silence of NASA came when you were looking at the same pictures that we're looking at now. With all of the fire and the smoke, you couldn't really see through it to see if the shuttle was still there. The first indication that it wasn't was when they said they lost all communications, all downlink video with the 